All right, so our series theme for this summer is Extraordinary Every Everyday Purpose. And for this fourth talk in our series, we're going to go ahead and talk about superheroes and heroic virtue. And uh, there's no one better to talk about that than uh, Father Paul Ibarra, CSC. Uh, Father Paul is a priest of the Congregation of the Holy Cross and currently serves as pastor of St. Adalbert and St. Casimir Church. He's a triple domer from Notre Dame who has earned an MDiv, Master's of, of Early Childhood Education and Teaching through the ACE program, and a BA in Film and Cinema and Video Studies. As a Marvel fan, he is here today to shed some light on where we can find examples of virtue among the various comic and uh, comic and fictional heroes we see on the big screen. So without further ado, Father Paul. So uh, brothers and sisters, I'm going to talk to you uh, a bit about um, mythology and, and storytelling and how important it is in terms of um, allowing us to grow in virtue, allowing us to grow in, in um, hopefully what my aim of my talk will be towards moral victories, towards um, having God um, at work in our lives and in accord with our good work. You know, we have free will, but uh, with free will in doing the good, there is divine providence and divine intervention that God is at work with us and through us. And so to kind of lead us into this, I, I'm going to get at some of the roots of, of some of the fiction that you're seeing on, on the cinema screen at the moment. Um, definitely with comic books, um, the golden age of comics is basically in the 1930s. And we have Superman and Batman, um, the DC comics. Um, most recently, um, Shazam, which is originally called Captain Marvel. And these powerful um, examples of, of, of heroic virtue lived out in, um, in, in comic books for, for kids. And so... Um, Superman being heroic in taking care of, of those most in need. Batman, he's actually a detective. <laughs> he solves crimes. It's actually, he was a detective comics. And so um, the roots of his character are really in, in solving mysteries. <laughs> um, and, and Shazam is kind of wish fulfillment for a, for a child to transform into a powerful hero. And so those are the Golden Age comics, and, and what we're here right now in, in, on the big screen with Avengers and Spider-Man and all that are more out of the Silver Age, um, you know, the post-war post age, and where you start to take up social issues. Um, you start taking up racism and, and ignorance um, of other cultures. So you get stuff like the X-Men, which are basically kind of um, an amalgam of, of people of supposed to be of differing cultures, except now they're, they're different type of people. They're mutants. But they're really supposed to be a stand-in for people of different cultures and, and the gifts that they bring. And, and, and the civil rights um, issues that are actually worked out in those comics. And now we have the modern age, and everything's kind of up thrown up in terms of like it can go any which way and so um, what I want to talk about specifically is mythology itself and how we understand it understanding it amongst our cultures and how we can begin to move that towards moral virtue um, the first influence that I want to speak of is uh, a psychoanal psychoanalysis or um, psychologist by the name of Carl Jung. Um, Jungian psychology speaks a lot about um, what we call archetypes or, um, you know, anima and animus, um, extroversion, introversion, shadow, collective unconscious. 
So what Carl Jung was basically getting at is that amongst all cultures, there, there's something that, that is present in everything. You know, there's, a, there's same stories, same kind of characters keep showing up. And, and these were very important as he led into psychoanalysis because he's like the beginner of like kind of dream analysis. Like, tell me about your dream. Tell me about, tell me about your story. And as he's listening to your story or your dream, he's basically being able to get at what's going on with you. Like, what are the things you are really afraid of? What are the things that are really stressing you out? What are the things that need to be healed for you to move forward? So Carl Jung's basically there. So, you know, kind of getting at these, these big concepts of an archetype, an archetypal imagery, um, of, of who we are in terms of our personality and our behavior. And he, he's investigating that. He's also a monster of psychoanalysis like him, he's a contemporary of Freud, open to spirituality. And that sometimes we are in need of spirituality, that we're in need of that in order to become free of whatever obstacle exists in our life. Um, in a kind of backward, like second, third hand type of way, he influenced Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and so the idea of abandoning yourself to a higher power, you know, a lot of that was influenced by Carl Jung. And so, um, and the reason why is that when he investigated and observed people, people who had strong faith were able to break free of certain behaviors that were damaging to them and damaging to the people around them there was conversion. And so he believed really that there was some power to it. But he's the psychoanalysis, he's only going about observable things. So he's open to spirituality, but he's not necessarily saying like, everyone needs to be spiritual. Person goes a little bit further than that. Um, I have any of Joseph Campbell, and he's gonna be a big influence on all the movies we're watching. <laughs> on all the comics, on all the, the way that those plots work, those storylines, because he believes in this concept called the monomyth, that there is a mythology, there's a story that is understood across all cultures, that there's something that's true that we have to go through in order to grow and mature in order to heal, in order to actually affect change in our world, in order to actually become a hero. And so he calls it the hero's journey. And so he has the idea of a hero of a thousand faces. He wrote a book called that. And he begins to look at all these world cultures and he, 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 he says that there's, there's some major aspects of all these cultures, of these different stories that they perform. Like one, one function of a, myth, a mythological story is it's a metaphysical. It's, um, it's about awakening the sense of awe, the mystery of being. You know, the symbols and mythic metaphors um, point outside of themselves into another reality, another realm. Um, that mythological symbols touch and exhilarate centers of life uh, beyond the reach of reason and coercion. The first function of mythology is to reconcile our waking conscience with our subconscious. So to become connected to our dreams, to become connected to um, that powerful connection that brings us together as a culture. And as a cosmological function, it helps us to understand why things exist. So in some ways, um, different parts of the literature of, of, of in the Bible, for instance, the book of Genesis, those are cosmological mythologies. They point to why things exist. As a Christian, it's not just simply like, why does the earth look like this? Or why is, um, why is the sky blue? Or why do these animals live in this realm versus that realm? The point of Genesis is relationship with God, that God is in relationship with his creation. It's a bit different than a lot of creation narratives 
or cos cosmological myths. Our myth points to a relationship with the divine. Then there's the sociological function. We have these mythologies to kind of form a history of a people. Um, you know, we might talk about Johnny Appleseed or Honest Abe or um, George Washington and the cherry tree. These are stories that point to what is it to be an American to a certain extent. And they're kind of told in those, in those functions, those type of mythologies kind of unify an American narrative. And then there's a pedagogical, func uh, uh, pedagogical function. Um, you know, it's, we tell stories to help people grow up, <laughs> how people experience death, how people experience pain and suffering, and actually know that there's hope beyond it. And so that's why you have a little element of that in a lot of these, these mythologies like Grimm's stories and like Cinderella. There's always aspects of death and, and, and pain and suffering, but there's an overcoming of it by our hero. And that's very important to give to children, that these things can be overcome. And so those are different functions of, of mythology. And for, for Campbell, he's able to condense it down, and if you look on your sheet there, he's able to condense it, everything down into the hero's journey. So it's, it's, he says, I look at all these narratives and I see this exact journey. And so you got the hero, he gets called to adventure. There's supernatural aid. Um, there's someone that guides him into another realm. And then he has, he has more helpers, he's got mentors, he's faced with temptation, and ultimately he, he actually experiences death and rebirth. He's transformed, he able to, he's, has atonement, he's able to defeat that which was his enemy. Sometimes it's just himself. <laughs> and then he's able to return. Um, this became really important and it became really important for our popular, popular culture with Star Wars. <laughs> As um, George Lucas was looking to, um, to write what is basically a space opera, kind of the stuff of, of his childhood. He said, like watching um, movies like Flash Gordon, there used to be an old Flash Gordon serials and, and radio plays and stuff like that. He wanted that type of adventurer and that type of thing. And so he turned to Joseph Campbell and began reading that book and used that to plot out his storyline over three, um, three movies, so, um, which would become A New Hope, um, Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. And so I'll, I'll tell you, it's basically Luke Skywalker gets called to adventure. He has some supernatural aid. It's Obi-Wan Kenobi <laughs> begins to lead him, and he's also his helper. Eventually, he meets his mentor on another planet, which is Yoda. And he's faced with temptation when he goes into the cave. He knows his enemy is Darth Vader. And some of you might know, I don't know if it's Dutch or, or German or anything. Darth Vader means dark father, but that maybe gave it, gives it away. Well, he goes in there and he defeats Darth Vader to only to find that it's, it's himself. As he removes the mask, he's looking at himself. So he enters into this abyss and death, death and re rebirth is when he actually confronts Darth Vader in actuality, he finds out that he actually is his dad and that his dad just cut off his hand and his only escape is to be, delve right into an abyss. <laughs> He's in a sky city, and he falls through, and he actually ends up in the sky, which is kind of odd. But he falls into this deep abyss, and by the third movie, he comes back reborn, in a way looking like a Catholic priest, of all things. And he is a master, a master of the Force. And the most important aspect aspect that he masters is reconciliation. He becomes reconciled with his father, and he begins to see in his father good. 
And it's in that power of, of reconciliation that there is healing. And it actually ends up saving him. And so this mythology that George Lucas came up with is found in dozens of stories. And most powerfully found in our own story of our own Christianity, uh, of the Christ and the Gospels, of this journey of Christ. Now, Joseph Campbell started out a Roman Catholic and became a polytheist. <laughs> so he, he's not exactly the best person to look to in terms of how this leads to heroic spiritual virtue. But he is someone that had an incredible influence on how we actually begin to plot out storytelling as we tell the, the superhero stories. For instance, we look at uh, Christopher Nolan. So if you look back at that image of the hero's journey, uh, the Christopher Nolan trilogy of Batman. So Batman, he has almost a su supernatural figure. It ends up becoming Ra's al Ghul, but he didn't know it's, it's, it's actually a villain who actually teaches him and disciplines him in, in, in a type of martial arts, almost like a ninja. And he faces temptation in order to, to actually kill people. But he, def he goes against that temptation and he seeks to save. There's transformation and atonement. He becomes unified in himself with that, that thing that leads him to wanting to, to create change in the world. And um, he returns, returns to his friends and family or, or his old girlfriend and I guess to his butler. Um, and then you just go through that, that journey again and again through the other three movies. <laughs> in fact, all three movies kind of take up these themes. There's actually pits in which he falls into and he has to ascend out of. There's actually, he has to actually enter into relationship with people and become healed. He has to actually grow as a person throughout. And so it just keeps repeating and repeating. And so this monomyth is so used in Hollywood with all these films. They just kind of go back to it over and over again. I don't know if you ever heard of um, a show called Community. A guy by the name of Dan Harmon writes that um, there's, um, what is it, Rick and Morty? He does uh, that cartoon. He does every episode using this outline. <laughs> so he just keeps following this outline and uses it for every episode that he writes. So it's consistently being used now in mo modern narrative, modern storytelling, because it's familiar. We understand it. It was actually used most recently um, with, by Disney uh, again in a reboot of The Lion King. The Lion King follows exactly this narrative outline, and then when they rebooted it, just stayed with it. <laughs> it's, a, it's almost the same movie shot for shot, except with CGI instead of um, cartoon drawings. And so we have this mythology. Well, how is this going to, and it's used in superhero movies, how is this going to be any good to us as Catholics growing in virtue? How, how are these narratives at all um, useful to us? And I, I turn to probably one of the greatest Catholic storytellers of all time, Tolkien. Tolkien uses mythology. He actually he doesn't use allegory. It's not like C.S. Lewis where you're like, that's Jesus. <laughs> it's obviously Jesus. No, Tolkien doesn't actually go with allegory. He's not saying this is a standing for this or like that. He's using mythology. He tells mythology like someone would tell a historical text. He actually goes in depth with like languages. He actually goes in depth with culture. He actually begins to explain a whole truth about something that doesn't actually exist. <laughs> But in telling it in a historical framework, it's actually a more powerful story. You know, maybe it's the reason why the Gospel of Luke's written the way it is. It's told in a historical manner because it's more powerful that way. We relate to it better in that way. 
And so he tells a historical story in terms of the Lord of the Rings. There are a few aspects of this type of mythology that are very powerful and might be, uh, might be helpful to all of us as Catholics. He believes in a fallen world, that there was this time in which all things were more perfect. And, and if you follow our biblical text and if you under, actually understand Catholic theology, we believe we're in a fallen world. People used to live longer. If you go back in the biblical text, if you had longer lives, all right? There was a greater connection with the divine. I mean, Adam and Eve were actually talking to God. They were in the garden with him, all right? And so the idea is that we are actually in a more painful, fallen state right here, right now. So that's the worldview in which Tolkien puts his storytelling. It's Middle Earth. It's, not, it's, it's like we're in the middle. <laughs> we're not, we're not where, we, where, we, where we were. And all the characters, especially the elves who seem to have been closer, closer to the divine, they're, they have a choice of whether they're going to go on to the eternal or they're going to die. They, um, and only a few characters are given that path. But again, this is an allegory. It's mythology. So it's not like, oh, this one's Jesus or this one's an angel or this one's that. He doesn't actually function that way. He's using it to point at moral virtue. And so um, one of the um, and so actually he says this, there is no better medium for moral teaching than a good fairy story. That's a quote from Tolkien. For Tolkien, mythology had to be recontextualized. So it isn't just telling a story um, using the hero's journey. It isn't just saying, oh yeah, these archetypes exist in all cultures. No, it has to be redeemed. And as Catholics, the way we create has to involve our morality. And so this is how he actually uses it in it. Um, it should be formed by the good and the true. And so for Tolkien, the moral victory was of greatest import. Winning battles meant nothing. Honor means nothing. Only virtue, a victory in the spiritual realm. Heaven means everything. So how we do things matters. Um, an example of this, if you, um, I'll say it is, as the movies, because I bet most of you have seen the movies, not so much the books. In the second movie, <laughs> there's King Theoden. And he's this, he's this king that looks like Norse mythology. They are like these horse people, but they all look like Vikings. And he has... He at first is afraid of, 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 for his people, of death. So instead of going out to meet the battle with this opposing evil force, he actually goes to Helm's Deep. He retreats and to protect them. Um, it isn't until he gets some outside help that he's actually saved and he's able to, to be saved through that. Some good comes in. Um, in the form of his, his nephew and their great cavalry come in and save them. But Theoden, he, what's a moral victory for him or a moral victory is that when he is called to help someone, he goes. He helps them. He ends up dying and when he finally answers the call to help another kingdom, Gondor. When, he, when they call him to help, he goes and he helps them and he dies a moral victory. He doesn't actually see them win. And that's what's important. He risked his life to save someone else. A greater cause than self-interest is a moral victory, regardless of outcome. One point needs to be made clear, though. Um, they did win the battle. Um, and it was with uh, the use of these otherworldly forces. I don't know if you remember like the use of like this army of the dead shows up and just like obliterates the opposing army. Um, it's always with this outside force, the dawn breaks and there comes Gandalf with another army. Um, the eagles show up 
all of a sudden in different points in, in these stories, like the eagles show up, it's like God coming in and swooping in to help them. And so this idea of divine providence is always at work. You can choose the good. God will be there right with you. And for those who choose evil, <laughs> he ain't going to help you. <laughs> but for those who choose good, divine providence comes. This is our belief in divine providence. It doesn't go against free will. It actually works with it. In choosing the virtuous and the good, God comes and is present with you. A big part of this is um, in how these characters kind of work this out. I was just talking to someone about, uh, I, we were talking about Endgame. <laughs> uh, I hate to ruin anything, but um, there's some time travel involved in that one. Our moral choices affect us. Even our past moral choices can end up helping us. And so I'll go back to Tolkien, and I won't give away the plot to Endgame. But in, in that, um, you remember the character of Gollum, this kind of like, kind of warped hobbit. <laughs> He's been warped by greed and, and obsession and, and by sin, basically. He killed someone. And he is a complete recluse. He's no longer living among society. He no longer knows the taste of bread. He is no longer one in his, in his feeding and in his, in his relationship with others. And so he's completely twisted and he's in pain. He's in pain because he's obsessed with this ring and his relationship to power, but not to God. And he is pitied in that he is a pitiful character. But pity is not a bad thing. Pity isn't bad. To have compassion for someone else is what saves him. Gandalf speaks, he's like, he has compassion. And so Gandalf, Gandalf tells uh, Frodo, like, we're not going to kill him. You know, actually, that's what, what caused uh, Bilbo, the uh, hobbit from uh, earlier story, The Hobbit, um, to not kill um, Gollum is compassion. He feels pitiful for this person who's been so twisted by power and evil. And it ends up saving them later because it's actually Gollum and his obsession that frees Frodo from actually having to destroy the ring himself. Because Frodo was going to give in to evil. But because he showed compassion in the past, it saved him. <laughs> and so compassion... These, these, these virtues are important, and they save us. Sometimes our compassionate past can save us here right here and right now. And so I came, when I go back to this idea of free will, and so you have... Um, the point isn't that free will and heroic virtue... virtue um, it's not actually the point of what he writes that story. The reason why he wrote Lord of the Rings, uh, he says this, it's about God and his sole right to divine honor. And it says the evil force, Sauron, desired to be a god king, and he would have demanded divine honor from all rational creatures and absolute temporal power over all the world. And so... Um, I can point to some of the comic book characters that are like this, and most, most recent, recently Thanos. He wants power to control. And if he can control it, he can control life and death. But that doesn't belong to him. It belongs to God. Now, Tolkien's really blatant about it. He's talking about our God. In the, even though he's not writing it in the mythology, he himself, the writer, tells this to other people. I'm talking about God, that divine honor belongs to God. It doesn't belong to some guy. <laughs> and it doesn't be belong to this evil, maniacal character that wants one ring to rule them all, who seeks to subjugate all others into world power under him. That is the Antichrist. That is anti-God. 
And so the good in order to fight that is one of sacrifice and one of friendship and one of honor, honor in a moral victory. And so you get these characters um, of like Faramir and Boromir who are like men. Um, you get uh, Aragorn who's this king. You get these people who make choices um, of sacrifice in order to save other people. It, one other thing that of uh, what is it, the morality of, um, of Tolkien? He believed that good people have some bad and bad people have some good, but that evil is evil and good is good. He did not believe in moral relativism. And so when I'm bringing up Boromir and Faramir and these other human characters in, in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, they make some bad decisions and they show some cowardice or they, they're not always doing the right thing for the right reasons. But ultimately, they, they act in the good. They have a chance to be redeemed. Bar Baromir is kind of selfish and he actually wants the ring for himself, but he actually dies saving the hobbits as they escape. And then actually, that last action, that last moral victory inspires um, one of the hobbits, Mary, to save his brother, to risk his life saving Faramir, his brother, later in the story. That the actions that we do, the moral victories, even if we die, have enormous effect on others and lead others to good moral choices. And so we can be morally complex, but as good Catholics, we're not, uh, there is no moral complexity to our logic or to our theology. There's good and then there's bad. But you can be good, you created good and can have some bad ideas at times and do some bad actions, but that doesn't make you bad. And evil is evil and must be fought. And so um, in terms of, I want to end on this divine intervention or this idea of the eucatastrophe, because that's um, the, the, when the eagles show up, where divine providence comes and works in our favor. Um, Tolkien called it the eucatastrophe. And so um, the true outcome of any choice belongs to God. All outcomes belong to God. Moral choices we have. We can make a choice, but we never know the full outcome of our choices. Every day we make choices. Every day we can make choices that are heroic, that could be saving, but we will never fully know the outcome of them. I doubt that any of the saints fully knew the outcome of their moral choices, fully. Like they didn't know that today, Joan of Arc didn't know we were gonna be praying to her today. <laughs> she had no idea that somewhere in Northern Indiana at a pizza place that a bunch of young adults would be praying, praying for her guidance and help. But yet her moral choice to fight for God matters it has um, but yet God God is in control of the outcome and so as we go through any of these um, these narratives um, a fully redeemed narrative or a fully good Christian narrative will always give due deference to God really having control over the outcome but that the a morally virtuous true outcome is that we are free to make choices and so as we go back into these super superhero narratives um the constant and which really drove the the golden age comics um their great fears was the with the elimination of choice that there would be di evil dictators <laughs> who would be in control and that the heroic had to fight that so that people would have freedom, freedom to choose. 
The good example is that they have freedom to choose the good, to sacrifice. So the hero represents that sacrifice. As um, I get back to breaking out into the discussion, I want you to look at, um, before we do that, I, I give you a little wheel on there. This is um, taken from Union Psychology, and it's these 12 archetypes that he came up with that are often used. Um, they're not only used in comic book narratives, um, they're used in brand advertising. <laughs> that even in commercial advertising, uh, commercial uh, companies will decide, are we the explorer uh, hero? hero? Or are we more of the every man? Are we the jester in terms of our brand? Or are we the innocent or the creator? And so I don't know if you go like Apple versus Nike or something like that. Um, so I thought that was interesting in terms of my, um, my research for this. But union characteristics. Um, so um, there are four main ones that get kind of played out in this current MCU, Marvel Cinematic Universe, or Marvel story, amongst the three main characters of Captain America, um, Thor, and Iron Man. And that is of the, the hero, the magician, and the ruler. Um, sometimes you might find that they're the outlaw or they're the lover. Um, they might be the jester, and they kind of flow through in it. But these aspects of, of the heroic, the self-sacrifice, and, and filling these kind of archetypes are often taken up by, um, by those three main characters of the hero, the ruler, and the magician. Um, the hero, uh, Captain America, is this traditional hero, someone who fights for justice, fights for the American way, fights for freedom. And you'll see that he continually does that in a very moral way. Um, he becomes less, um, I guess he becomes more complex by the last movie that he's in. Um, he starts to cuss. <laughs> And he starts to joke around more, and he deals with uh, overcoming depression by going to a, a self-help group. But um, he becomes a more complex character, but he's always self-sacrificial. And um, in that movie, there's a great battle, and he just gets right back up, and he's ready to go right at it again. And all of a sudden, a catastrophe happens, and everyone else shows up. <laughs> so that the good comes in. And those are those like moments that people are like, oh my gosh, that looks wonderful. And he has all this help and aid because he continues to true, choose a moral victory. The ruler, I guess, um, as we go along, he might have started out as a gesture. He might have, in a way, been a lover, but he ends up more of a ruler, and that's Tony Stark. He becomes the good king. In, in this kind of comic book universe of the MCU, he is the beginning and the end, <laughs> at least of this phase four or, or whatever, the phase three of how they make these movies, 21 movies, he's the beginning and the end of them. And he has the, 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 he has the first and last word. <laughs> so he mimics in a weird way Christ. <laughs> Um, in terms of the Alpha and Omega within this MCU universe. And if you, I give you kind of like the characteristics of each of those archetypes. And he, towards the end, he begins to fulfill that because he, um, so worried with control and terrorism and the like, he finally realizes that the good ruler is the one who sacrifices and heals, who gives his life for others. And he becomes that and embodies that at the end who starts out kind of like the magician, but that's only because he's a mythical character. Thor goes around flying with a magical hammer. Um, he, um, he too goes through this hero's journey, um, and he's still the only character that's still going, and so 
we'll probably see him cycle through. Um, he abdicated his throne, gave away his throne to another, and now he's continually as a character. Um, I think he's going to end up giving away even his power, his hammer, and it's going to be a woman who takes it up. We'll have a female Thor in the next movie. Um, before I go on and actually break out into any of your groups, is there any questions before we move on? Any questions about any of the things I covered? All right, so as you um, break up to, to being um, in your small group table discussion, I'd like you to kind of like take, these are just, these are like templates uh, for mythology. Um, the hero's journey, um, they're templates to kind of like the idea of an archetype. It can be found in anyone's life, in anyone's life story. So the first question, how do you relate to your own hero's journey? Are there events in your own life that mirror this archetype? Have you experienced death, pain, suffering, and actually come out at the other end? Do you know, are there people who are heroic in your own life that, that kind of shine forth as superheroes in your own life? And um, go on to, have you ever won a moral victory? Have you sensed God's providence at work in your life? That you made a good decision and it might not have been a successful decision, but you felt that ultimately it turned out right because God was right there with you. That God is the one who actually brought around the good end. So the you catastrophe. I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that. And then what archetypes or superheroes do you relate with? Uh, what virtue of theirs do you admire? And what might God be calling to you in your own hero's journey? your own story, your own narrative. Unless you think I'm, why, why a priest is talking about it other than my film degree. <laughs> um, we constantly use this, um, this is a whole vein of, of, of theology called narrative theology. And you probably hear a lot of priests, they always tell a story before they actually get into the gospel um, explanation. But it's the idea that Stories allow us to enter into the realm of the divine or the realm of the spiritual, help us actually begin to connect to universal truths. And so that's why us priests, we tend to do story, Bible, and then conclusion. <laughs> We're not very complicated in our homilies. And so how are you as storytellers? What are some of the stories in that? I hope you're able to share some with the people at your table. Well, I, I think what's um, incredibly important in terms of like integrating some of, this, some of these ideas into your, your own life, um, I think of, for me, uh, I know a lot of people think of like their parents as heroes, but I, I think of my own mother. And um, there was an incident when, when I was a teenager and we were out in, a, in the park at a picnic, and um, this kid um, is playing basketball as uh, maybe a 14 or 15 year old kid, and he just collapses in the middle of the court. And um, my mother knew immediately what to do. Um, and it was something that I didn't know. I was. As her kid, I didn't always know what her life was like prior to me, <laughs> but she had worked in the Red Cross and she had training and she immediately held this kid. And for me, it, it, like this imagery comes to my mind and I start thinking of the Pieta and I think of Mary holding her son and I'm like, but that's not me, that's some other kid. And, um, and some of the other imagery kind of like floods my mind because I'm, I'm Mexican. My mother is Mexican, but she's light skinned. She's blonde and fair skinned. And the kid who she's holding is African American. And, and it also is kind of emblematic of how, who my mother was as a person in terms of her love and care for others and her service to others. And so when I, when I, 
when I think of that narrative and that story about my mother and her, her, her who she was in, in a heroic person to me, and how she in, in some ways saves this child and is present to this child and takes care of him, um, and it's not even me. <laughs> and that it, she's willing to do that for other people. She shines forth in a brilliant example of what it is to be heroic in terms of self-sacrifice and, um, and who she represented to me in terms of who I need to be eventually in service to others. And so like, those are the type of things that I think you kind of can work through in terms of narratives and stories, um, in terms of your own hero's journey. Um, I don't know if, others that you, uh, or some of the ideas that came out in your discussion that you'd like to share? Or even some questions of like where the heck I was coming up with any of this? <laughs> I think one of the first things we talked about was just how it's hard to relate to the hero's journey necessarily because you know movies can pack who knows how much time into like an hour and a half it's very easy to view like the ups and the downs and the major events and the you know the failures and in our lives things can be so minuscule and you don't really think about it as you know a hero's journey um but we were just talking about how it was hard to even think of stuff just because you don't think of yourself as heroic yeah and it seems so so minute and so minuscule that yeah it's not world changing. Um, some of it can be simply, uh, as um, Yun would kind of, kind of getting at like defeating this type of like, um, like death or your dragon or, or in, in these stories, like slaying the dragon. Sometimes it's just some overcoming your own obstacle, like something that was in your own path, you know, some of your own fear. Um, you know, I think in my own life, um, I'd like to have been more heroic than I was. When I was when I played football. I was an uh, offensive tackle and wanting to be a, like a star player in all these things. And my coaches would always talk about like you can go to college because your your height or your speed and your strength you can do do great in that. But the greatest thing I had to overcome was my fear that um, my quarterback would get hurt. <laughs> the, I was his blind side, so I was protecting him. And I had this nightmare that I had to overcome. And that was his sister was in my class. And I imagined Amanda the next day after the, or the, the following week, because we played on Fridays, um, crying. <laughs> I had this dream of her crying. And, and I came up to her and said, why are you crying? Because you didn't protect my brother, <laughs> like that he got in hurt in the game because of me. So I had to get overcome that fear in order to do that. So I mean, just any, any fear or anything we have to overcome in order to do good in our own life or actually to grow is a heroic journey. And it doesn't always have to end in, I saved the world. <laughs> I that bus was, was going off into a, a ditch or it was coming off a bridge and I, I pulled it back as if. <laughs> I cured cancer, I don't know, maybe. I, I, I don't think that's the heroic journey that any of us are necessarily gonna have. But, you know, relatable instances where we saw something of great, uh, of great virtue with someone that we loved and cared for and, that's heroic. And then in our own lives where we overcome and grow and mature. And I think for many of you, you're still kind of, um, you're, you haven't actually come out the other end on that journey. <laughs> and maybe that's the truth of, of being a young adult <laughs> is that you're still maybe on the precipice of going into that other world, of entering into another way of being. For some of you who have gotten married, have, have become another person, have become another way of being for other people, that is a huge leap, <laughs> a huge leap of faith and a huge transformation. But for some, you're still, you're still wondering, is this the right person? Or am I doing the right job? Am I along the right path? 
And the key to it, I, I believe, is, is are, do you live a virtuous life? And are you overcoming fear? Because if you can do both those things, I think you can accomplish some very heroic things. So I think in some characters, there's a, um, maybe sort of like a comedy that accompanies them that I wonder, are they being jester hero figures or are they sort of expressing a disenchantment or a distrust in the, the, the possibility that there could be a real hero? So someone like Deadpool or whoever the main guy is from Guardians of the Galaxy or even Tony Stark and sort of his like occasional snarkiness. Um, do you think that they're, they're sort of expressing this pursuit of a connection through enjoyment or that they're, the creators are like prodding the idea that is a hero even possible? Um, there's, with, okay, there's a couple of different things that you kind of brought up in terms of comic book characters. Deadpool as a character, um, it's kind of profane, <laughs> um, breaks the fourth wall, kind of exists out even inside of his own comic, he exists outside of the comic in a way that he can observe and understand what's going on in the narrative. So it's a critique of comic books. And his whole, the last couple of movies are a critique of comic book movies. And so the whole time he's almost like um, he has like what we call like a Shakespearean aside. He's 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 commentating on what's occurring. He's constantly looking into the camera, and he's even bringing up for the people that are actually going on to see those movies um, characters that they might understand that do that. So he doesn't bring up Shakespeare. He brings up Ferris Bueller. <laughs> And he actually referenced it at the end of the first movie, like, I'm just like Ferris Bueller. I talk right to you. And so as I go through my journey, as I go through my hero's journey, you follow me, even though we both know that this is a movie. <laughs> we both know that how it's going to end. We both know that that guy played another character in another movie, and he's constantly joking about himself the actor who's playing him and all those other things so it's kind of a meta uh, meta uh, critique on um, hero the hero's journey or the hero heroic storytelling whereas I think uh, I would you have with with Iron Man and with with um, Star Lord who you brought up from Galaxy um, is you have someone who's mature, <laughs> who's a little kid, or is a teenager, and he talks like a teenager. And teenagers, they, they reference pop culture. Teenagers reference, uh, have, have inside jokes. Teenagers like to draw attention. So the comedic, the jester, is, is commentating, but he's, he's doing so as as, as the funny person in the classroom, the class clown, all right? So it isn't so much that, um, and we, we actually don't see those characters stay there. So they may be there for like a movie or 10 and how this um, MCU thing breaks down, but they eventually reach maturity. And, um, and again, giving away Endgame, Iron Man actually gets to becoming the father, becoming the king, becoming the ruler. He becomes that in his full narrative arc. Um, some characters, their narrative arc occur off site, like, like the Hulk is automatically now okay with both sides of himself. That, you didn't actually see that, but he fulfills a whole narrative arc in which now he's Professor Hulk. He's smart and he's brawny, he's both things. Um, he begins to embody these characters as one person. He's integrated, he's a fully integrated character, completed his arc. And so they, often when we talk about narratives or stories, is do they complete their arc? Do they actually fulfill the journey? Um, do they fulfill the full narrative? And some of these characters are still, still in the midst of it. So Spider-Man 
in his many iterations. I mean, he's been a teenager three times over already. They've, they're, they're on his third trilogy. Uh, they didn't even finish the second trilogy, and they only made it to two films, and it was so bad that they, they just stopped. <laughs> and so um, some of the characters will never, or versions, the Andrew Garfield Spider-Man will never grow up. <laughs> we'll never know what his Spider-Man would be like, but this current Spider-Man, the Tom Holland version, yeah, he'll, he'll eventually grow up and get out of high school. Thank you, Father. Um, to what degree is um, this paradigm of the hero's journey influential in cultures that are more collectivistic, um, such as like cultures from the East or in Africa? Um, I guess we're wondering um, if that even changes in those kinds of cultures. Collectivistic, um, yeah, there's still the return. And so there, it, it, the return might not be an individual thing, like the return of the king. Okay, so the person comes back and he's, he's now a good leader. He comes back. So that, that's maybe a more individualistic kind of approach to things, but the return might actually just be coming back to the village. And, he's, and they're able to enter into the cycle again where they raise their child. All right, so um, a lot of ritual aspects um, I guess like we, we, we've tried it in the past um, as a church with confirmation, trying to make it kind of a coming of age story for the kids. <laughs> it's like, yes, we're going to send you out on mission. I'm 15. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you want me to go preach now? Um, this, 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 this journey of a full initiation in the church and then we send you out. We don't necessarily do that. We just say like, no, now you can minister in the church. You go, go be a Christian minister or something. Um, so you actually just come back to the group. Um, some of it was thought was like, even, even in the Latino culture with the quinceanera, you know, like, so it's the coming of age of the girl. She's no longer a girl, she's a woman. Why? Because she's vowed herself to live out her baptismal vows and with the influence of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now that Mary is interceding on her behalf, she's ready to be a woman. It's a little young and by her modern standard to now she's ready to go get married at 15? No, not now. <laughs> but maybe when this was more common, especially amongst a lot of cultures with the debutante ball and even like the Cinderella thing, you know, they go to the ball, why? To find your husband, <laughs> to, to now enter into womanhood, to actually enter into adulthood. And so those still exist in those other cultures. It just doesn't mean like a more, like an individualistic kind of outcome. It might be more of a, a communal return. They return to take their place within the community. Do you have a favorite superhero? Oh, my whole time favorite. When I was a little kid, it was Spider-Man. Because I, I had, um, I had the, the pajamas. <laughs> um, I, I had, I had Spider-Man underwear. Um, I was a huge fan of, uh, I mean, I, obviously, like, I'm like such a dork about all these characters that I, I was a huge fan of Superman. There's this picture that my mother has of, of me as, as like, I think it was three or four, and I'm crying. I'm on the floor throwing a tantrum, and my older sister is dressed up like Wonder Woman standing over me. And for some reason, she had a cape. And even at that young age, I knew Su Wonder Woman doesn't have a cape. Superman has a cape. I'm Superman. I need the cape. And so... But my sister kept the cape. <laughs> and I, I actually brought that up in the homily because every Good Friday, I get to wear a red cape. <laughs> it's, for the, it's for the death of Jesus, but it's, I get to put a cape on. <laughs> um, so wish fulfillment fulfilled as, an, as a priest. Um, 
but it, it as a, as a child it was it it was the characters that were more relatable, and what's powerful about Spider Man is he wears a mask, so he can look like me. Whereas the other characters, like it's very hard for me as, and you might not know. I don't know if I'm like a generation away from all of you. Um, I always think of Superman as Christopher Reeve. Um, like he, even when they cast new people in him, I I still think of Christopher Reeve as Superman. Like he is like burned into my mind. Um, I still think of Michael Keaton as Batman. Like um, and so I I don't I don't think of those other actors or other people who played them. And I'm sure my mother might have thought of like Adam West as Batman or um, I can't remember the actor's name. There's in the 19, um, 40s and 50s, there was like a, a, um, a version of Superman that was emblematic. And so like certain, certain images stick and burn your mind, but Spider-Man, he always had a mask. So Peter Parker could look like anyone. All right, um, so I have a quick two-parter for you. Two-parter, um, okay. Two-parter. Got so, a sequel, all right. Right, yeah. <laughs> so the first part, the first question is, um, so in a world that seems to not value um, virtue um, in society, um, how do we make virtue more attractive? Um, and the second part is uh, when we're facing temptation, um, how do we... Um, what advice would you have to win those moral victories? There, uh, the first part in terms of virtue, I take very seriously that Tolkien as a Catholic, when he wrote, wrote in such a way that he, he, he pointed at Catholic virtues um, and, and Catholicism. Now he, of course, it wasn't explicit in the storyline. It wasn't like, Oh my gosh, that person's the Pope and 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 Lord of the Rings or something like that. It didn't work like that, but the the characteristics and stuff. So part of it is like when you're when you're actually writing stories or part of the creative process, to always involve your faith. Never see that as something that's like um, I find it problematic about anyone in any walk of life that they've removed their faith as part of the equation. You know, whether it be like politics or, you know, maybe it's the actor or actress who is on, who's going to mass every time on Sunday, but they're not always putting out the, the good narrative or the virtuous narrative out there and not actually lifting up uh, aspects that would really help people and help form people. And so I think our occupations and what we do should, should be virtuous. Um, and it, and uh, the heroic aspect is that we influence other people, all right? So by us using those virtues in, in our everyday life and living them out by seeking moral victories, by seeking um, to do compassion, to, to self-sacrifice, by us living those out each and every day, we're, we're changing and forming other people. That's the life of the saints. The communion of the saints is that we're continuously finding new ways to be like Christ. And so that's the first part. The second part is always to take the long view. You know, as I said, the, uh, the outcomes belong to God. And God's already told us how it ends. I am a, I want to be honest with you, I am terrible at reading uh, novels and the like. I, when I go to a bookstore or even before I see a a movie. I'll actually say, well, how does it end? I'll, I'll read the last, I'll, le I'll read the end. And if I don't like the end, I won't read the book. <laughs> if I don't like the end, I won't watch the movie. And part of that is, um, as a Catholic, as a Catholic priest, I know how this ends. <laughs> it's victory in Christ. I already believe that. And so, God has control of the end, so I can have hope. So that's how I overcome temptation. Like, this is, this is but a moment. This is but one aspect of weakness. This can be overcome. All right, so, um, and I'm not perfect in that. You know, no one, I don't think anyone is completely perfect in any of these things. But I think that, you know, I'm, I'm not seeking meaning in my life. I'm not in some 
grand depression about where am I going to do with the rest of my life? Um, does my life have meaning? Because there, I know what the end is in mind. I know where we're heading towards. And each and every day I work towards that, that great end. And so I think that's how one overcomes temptation is to have the end in mind. It, and and it's, not, it's not gonna be under my control. It, it's really not within my control. I'm not gonna, I'm not control freak. I'm not like, yeah, it's gotta look like this. And, and like, uh, as if I'm gonna flip a switch and everyone's gonna become Catholic or something like that. Everyone else is gonna become virtuous. Like I have any control over that. No, but I can be compassionate as Christ is compassionate. I can, I can um, seek to, to be sacrificial and careful in, in how I interact with other people. I can seek moral virtue in how I interact. I can be merciful and forgiving. And I can help other people move along that path and walk with them. And help them not like control them, but actually walk with them. As maybe my role is to be the mentor or would, would be more like um, on the pack, the helper on someone else's hero's journey, okay? So um, knowing all, all too well that it ends in Christ. Can you think of an example off the top of your head of a character or maybe even a real life person who had two different, uh, like a combination of two different archetypes? Or you're, so, so you're talking about like, well, you know, as I said before, like, um, you, if I just want to go by Marvel, you can, each of these characters at different points in the comic books or in the movies take on different archetypes because they're, the narratives are different in each of them or who they are in relationship to who's the actual heroic figure or protagonist creates difference. And so... There's lots of examples of any of the comic book characters fit those things. Um, but right off the, uh, in terms of like ones that would be emblematic in terms of real life, um, well, I can think of the saints, all right. So my, my favorite, um, the, the person I took for my confirmation name is Thomas More. Um, he he was he was beheaded, so whatever victory he got, it was it was completely moral. <laughs> it wasn't a worldly victory, <laughs> but um, in some ways he he moves it from the sage and to the heroic. All right, he moves from someone who has this great knowledge of. of of the law and of, of theology, who's incredibly learned, is an advisor to another. He serves the king, and then he, but at the end, he, he lives completely as the hero, um, as he's willing to give his life, while also not compromising um, in, his, in who he is to the king and to God. So hence, the martyrdom. And so, um, so I, I, I do think of the saints. Um, you brought up Joan of Arc. Um, she definitely falls in the, in the hero. Um, she, in some ways, might be in the outlaw <laughs> as she was, she was imprisoned. And so um, character or, or even within our own life, we, we can take up some of these other, these other signs. Um, and definitely certain stories of the saints or even the, ange the angels themselves, like Michael. Um, you can go with anti-hero if you really want to go. One of the things that uh, Carl Jung brought up are the shadow side. The, the, and so one of the great examples of a shadow side or shadow ruler is the devil. And um, one of the great narratives that have ever been written in a poem is uh, A Paradise Lost. And so reading Milton's poem, you understand that he's a protagonist. The devil <laughs> is the protagonist, but he's evil. He, and and he, he, instead of 
actually he wants to rule, but he wants to rule and subjugate and, and he and, and, and distort and pervert. And so um, one of the other aspects of um, that isn't in some of these archetypes is the shadow side or the the shadow king or the shadow of any of these things that that shine forth the the perverted or the distorted image and the devil is definitely an anti-hero in in the narrative of paradise lost all right thank you father paul let's get one last round of applause for father paul thank you thanks for coming thanks for your time and everything and thanks for sharing <laughs>